Welcome back to Decode. This is the podcast where we talk about all things headless WordPress and modern web development in general. And uh, we're back this week with um, a cool episode. Uh, this one we're calling our Next.js Conf Rumor Roundup. Um, so if you haven't heard or are unaware, um, on uh, the 26th of this month, in October 26, 2021, uh, Vercel has announced that they're putting on another Next.js conference. And um, Next.js is a very popular and much beloved um, React framework. And there's a lot of speculation about you know what uh, might come out, what features might be added. So we thought it'd be kind of fun to talk through uh, what some of those might be, in addition to some of our wish list items, things that we uh, think would be really cool to see added to Next.js. Uh, I'm Kellen Mace, and joined um, I'm joined by Will Johnston. How's it going, Will? Going well. I'm uh, excited for this one. I think uh, you know Next.js is really close to my heart. <laughs> And given that I am working a lot on Faust.js and which, uh, is, you know, is deeply integrated with Next, uh, I'm excited to see what they, what they can come up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, I've, um, like so many others, I've grown to like Next.js and all the niceties it provides, all the, uh, um, we have whole episodes on, you know, comparing different frameworks and some of the things Next does, but, um, but these days, it seems like you know one of the best choices to do to do uh, React applications. The uh, the interesting thing that I've seen is that you know typically as uh, software projects and and frameworks grow, they get more and more dissenters, you know, and like the satisfaction goes down over time. And it feels like Next right. has had the opposite curve, right, where the satisfaction has increased. Uh, with user growth, which is pretty incredible, right? It is. Yeah. So yeah, shout out to um, the team who's uh, both the folks, you know, employed by uh, Vercel working on this product, as well as, you know, any open source contributors who, um, you know, helped out with the project. Uh, it's, yeah, it's quite a, quite a spectacle. <laughs> um, so uh, with that, let's dive into like what we think uh, could be announced and have some fun, you know, with, with those speculations. Um, this conference is, uh, is a special one because the fifth anniversary of Next.js and they've really stepped up their game, in my opinion, with these conferences. Like if you, uh, compared to their own past conferences that Vercel has, has put on, uh, but even yeah. compared to their, their competitors, I would argue, you know, if you watch, um, like, a uh, a, a Gatsby conference for, for example, you'll see like some of the, um, uh, the founders or some of the folks just, you know, coming up to the mic and, and, uh, just like I'm doing now, I'm saying, saying, um, and, um, tripping over my words slightly. It's like that, <laughs> right. It's like that. It feels yeah. a little, a little more unscripted. It's, it's like, yeah. So, uh, let's, um, talk about this next feature. Yeah. So it's like this, you know, it's a little unscripted, a little more off, off the cuff. And, and next, it seems like, is going in the opposite direction where it feels like it feels to me like an Apple keynote, you know, yeah, very these, buttoned up. Yeah. It's this very bu buttoned up, um, you know, it, you can tell they, they, uh, you know, hire, uh, a, a legit film crew, you know, who's gonna, <laughs> who's gonna uh, have everything very, very scripted and have multiple camera angles and, uh, yep. very high, very high production quality. Right. And Guillermo is going to be waxing poetic about here's where the web, you know, <laughs> here's where the web how far the web has gone, and here's how far we can take it, right? And it's uh, remarkable. It's remarkable. The Johnny <laughs> Ive doing the Johnny yeah. Ive thing. <laughs> yeah. So they've really stepped it up um, in terms of the production value. It's, it feels very similar to like an Apple keynote. And I know yeah. from from interviews I've heard with Guillermo, he parts of parts of Apple's kind of philosophy he doesn't like, like how everything is a closed source walled garden or whatever. Other uh, aspects of uh, of Apple, he really does like and appreciate. And one of them is, is um, you know the uh, the presentation yep. and uh, engagement with the community and so on. So I think that's where where that stems from. But anyways, with all that said, let's talk about uh, what we think could be unveiled and uh, and what we think would be cool to see. Um, what things are on our wish list. So uh, the first one we have here is on demand page revalidation. And Will, this was an item you uh, added to the list. Um, yeah, what would that, I, that look like? 
So I'll start by saying I think this is probably the feature that most people are hoping for. Um, and if you're familiar with Next, you know what uh, incremental static regeneration is and how it's done in Next. But for those who aren't, uh, Next lets you um, statically generate pages and then tell, you know, you can inform Next like, hey, uh, I want to regenerate this page every, you know, one second, two second, 15 minute, 20 minute, whatever. You can give it a timeout period for a statically generated page after which it will regenerate the page. Uh, it does this with a stale while revalidate header, and it generally provides a seamless experience for users um, coming to your site. They don't really notice what's going on. It serves a stale page, and then it replaces it with a, uh, a regenerated page at the you know timeout that you suggest. And this works and it actually is like a pretty ingenious like simple way um to get incremental static regeneration to work you know you can set a timeout uh, uh in faust we actually used to set a timeout of one second we've since switched that to 15 minutes but um but it's just a way to make it work without having to think about a lot of you know what is changing in your data and, and other things like that so mm -hmm. However, uh, if you really want to optimize to the nth degree, you want something that you can say, you know, like you want to be able to tell next, hey, I want to regenerate this page right now. You know, I don't want to wait for another 15 minutes or I don't want to catch you like mid cycle. Uh, and, you know, so I just want to regenerate the page right now. And so I think a lot of people are hoping for on demand page revalidation or regeneration. And what I'm thinking for, you know, for the WordPress, headless WordPress users out there is uh, being able to say anytime somebody has um, updated a post or published a new post or a page or a custom, con a custom post type, something like that, being able to say, okay, here are four or five URLs that I need to regenerate based on this update. Um, I don't know what uh, on-demand page revalidation will look like within Next, but it will enable a lot of functionality like that once it does exist. Yeah, that would be very cool. And for the folks listening out there, you know, you may be um, listening to Will's description of of those those features and comparing them to what you might be accustomed to with uh, traditional. WordPress, you know, and, and this, uh, this isn't a new problem. This has existed in um, traditional WordPress sites for a while where, you know, what's uh, very common is for performance reasons, um, many companies and many, uh, site owners, they choose to, um, turn on a full page, full page caching for their WordPress site, which, you know, achieves this, th these, uh, very quick speeds where you can have a, you know, statically generated HTML version of your page and then distribute that across the CDN. So it's at the edge, close to your, your users and have a very quick initial load. So that's all great. But at a certain point, you have to bust the cache and, um, and revalidate that, that page. And with many solutions in the past, um, there was no way to, to do that manually. You know, Well, I shouldn't say there's, there's no way. Like many caching solutions have, have kind of like the nuclear option, which is flush my yes. entire cat flush all pages so like there, things like that have existed but in my experience they've been inelegant you know where it's like you, you either flush every page that exists or just wait an hour or 30 yeah. minutes or however long your page cache is those are your only options there isn't a way to kind of you know i have this granular control over when pages are flushed from the cache um so that's you know that's yeah, what this it's... was would enable right it, and it can get frustrating, especially for users of, uh, you know, your WordPress site or something where they don't know much about the technology going on underneath or whatever, but it, they expect to publish a post and it updates on the front end. And you have to have a conversation with them that's like, hey, we have some optimizations on your site and you're not going to see a change for could be in this window of like zero minutes to an hour and a half or how you know how long you have uh for revalidation right. and so having that conversation is really difficult especially if you're in an agency and you're working with a lot of customers you have to have that conversation a lot 
Um, so being able to say, hey, you could have the page open and make a change on your CMS and then just see the change happen in real time, um, that's, that is extremely powerful. And that's what on-demand regeneration or revalidation right. can do. Yeah, and the usual solution to that in traditional WordPress is is to disable page caching if the person's logged in. So yeah. that's typically done. So your content, you know, creators they can update a blog post, hit save or or hit preview or whatever, and then see it. Right, everything looks good. But if they publish those changes, and then maybe in an incognito window or a different browser or their phone or whatever, then they go to it. They would, you know, they might. Yeah, they get confused, get confused saying, "Wait, my change isn't there yet." It's yep. because the cache hasn't been validated yet. There can be these weird scenarios. I've seen um, that happen all the time. And I've, and I've talked to people who get really, I mean, the people who don't understand that what's going on underneath, they're like, did it update? What's going on? You know, like, am I, why am I seeing this change? Uh, and you have to remember and you have to remind them every time, like, hey, if you're logged in, you'll see the change. If you're not logged in, you won't. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. go to, you know, go to bed wake up tomorrow, maybe the change will be there on the site <laughs> maybe, at that point. Maybe you'll see. And, <laughs> and which isn't a, which is not a fantastic UX, right? If I want to deliver yeah. a site to my clients, you know, and the pub, want, I want the publishing team to be thrilled with this experience, having this weird delay where their changes aren't reflected yeah. for a while, you know, can be kind of annoying. Um, the other thing I want to and, point out is what we've, go ahead, Will, you're going to say something else? Uh, and it can also be a timing thing. I mean, if you're trying to, uh, if you have a some sort of event that's happening and you're trying to push a last minute change or or something like that, you don't want to have to wait an hour. I mean, that can you can lose out on a lot of time where you can get new uh, you know users sure. on your site or do a big marketing push or things like that. So, yeah, true. Uh, being able to to change things on demand is really valuable, but you also have to balance not overloading your site, right? So. That's where the time-based revalidation is. It, it's like a good catch-all right now, but it if you set it too low, you end up overloading your site. Yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's talk about that a bit. Well, tell us why um, why this ISR revalidation isn't free, and why you wouldn't just want to crank it down to every every few seconds. Like, what problems could you run into with that? Yeah, a number of things. So uh, in actually in Faust, we um, kind of an oversight when it, it, you know, earlier in the days of Faust, we had ISR revalidation set to one second by default. Now we let you configure it. And there were plenty of people who, who brought this to our attention and, and we just said, here's how you configure it. Now we've since changed it to 15 minutes. Uh, we figure that's like a good balance between mm -hmm. getting, not having a bunch of stale data and not overloading your server, but, uh, particularly in, in headless WordPress. Uh, every query you make to WordPress is a request, right? So if you're making several queries to WordPress within, uh, and this could be for assets as well as GraphQL queries or REST API queries or, or anything like that that mm -hmm. exists on your WordPress site, uh, all of those things are, are requests that can bog down your server. Um, so you want to make as few of those as, as possible. And if you, set, if you just say, I'm going to set ISR to one second, um, while those requests may be going on in the background, so the user experience on your front end is good, yeah. uh, and they're still getting a page very quickly, in the back end, you can be making tons of requests all the time to your WordPress site and slowing it down. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's it can be tricky to, to figure this out and, and figure out why this is happening. Um, Especially, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be looking in your WordPress server logs to understand like, hey, there's lots of requests that are timing out or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to understand if you're interested in going the headless WordPress route, you know, I've heard people um, talking about, you know, porting their, their personal site, you know, their blog over to a headless architecture, for example. And they'll say things like, oh, yeah, and then I can put, you know, the WordPress backend because it's no longer serving end users. It, it doesn't really have to be lickety split fast. You know, yeah. I can I can put it on a five dollar digital ocean droplet <laughs> or some, you know, some cheap shared hosting or whatever else, because that doesn't matter. My site is, you know, built in next or next or Gatsby or something else it is fully static. It's served on a CDN. 
you know, and it only when pages need to be rebuilt in the background, the user is no longer waiting for anything. As you said, well, it's just in the background. It would hit my WordPress backend to regenerate yeah. these pages every now and again. Right. But if they're not careful and they, you know, have, if they have thousands of blog posts and then they um, set that, you know, revalidate number very low, that's every couple seconds you're getting thousands of requests potentially yeah. to your backend. So you do have to, to be careful with that. Yeah. Especially on a, a high traffic site and the, the advantage, even if you set ISR low now, the advantage is uh, to your end users, they won't really notice that slowdown on your WordPress site. So I still think that mm -hmm. you do get a better experience in a headless site than you do uh, with the monolithic WordPress site, but uh, you still have to be careful. Right. Yeah, certainly. All right. Um, so let's move on now. Uh, we wanted to talk about uh, core web vitals. This is a, a buzzword that Google has pushed and the industry is <laughs> taking seriously. Uh, we have a whole yep. episode that we've done for folks who are interested in learning more about core web vitals and then maybe some tips and tricks that you could employ for headless WordPress projects even to score well on core web vitals. But um, it, uh, for this next year specific episode, we want to talk about how um, how next is trying to make it very easy to score, you know, highly on core web vitals. So what have you seen? Well, like what strides are they making in this direction? Yeah. So, uh, when I think of core web vitals, I think of anything that makes your page load faster. So one thing that might not fall under the, you know, how Google looks at your site in terms of core web vitals, but um, within Next, Next has uh, a link component, right? And the link component can prefetch pages and make it faster for you to go uh, to new pages. As of today, that component just goes and finds all links on your site and, and visits them all, um, all internal links, and prefetches them. I think that a, a pretty easy thing for them to implement would be to do that based on where you are in the page or the visibility or where your mouse is moving or, or something like that. Um, so it'd be nice to see something there outside of that other, um, you know, the, the three metrics of core web vitals, the largest contentful paint, the cumulative layout shift and, uh, first input delay, those kinds of things can be sped up with next. I mean, they already do a great job with first input delay uh, for static pages and things. Uh, but other other things, largest contentful paint, this is where next image comes into play. Um, and and cumulative layout shift as well. Uh, and And also, there could be some sort of component that next has that helps you dynamically load uh, your page and and make queries as needed based on the user scrolling down the page. So anything around that would be really helpful. Definitely. Um, what about ES lint rules? Um, from what yeah. I recall in the last uh, next JS conference, um, uh, several were added, in, including some um, that have to do with uh, accessibility and performance, things like that. Yep. So do you expect like even more of those? Yeah, I think so. And they they released an ESLint plugin and then next sites start using the ESLint, next ESLint plugin uh, by default. And I think that they, uh, you know, this is a commitment to them. It's not only for core web vitals, but also just generally website building standards and things. I think they have around 15 rules. Um, centered around, uh, you know, some SEO stuff, some core web vitals things, some next, next best practices, um, mm. and some accessibility, uh, things. So yeah, I expect more investment in ES lint rules and, and, and more rules around core web vitals for sure. Mm. And for listeners out there, uh, if you're not familiar, ES lint rules, that would be like in, in your code editor when you get the red mm -hmm. squiggly lines indicating that there's some, some problem, you know, next now is, uh, bringing some of their own, you know, rules to the table there. Um, yeah. And, and so that could be anything like if you accidentally put a synchronously loading script in your, uh, in your app, they'll let you know, like, Hey, this isn't recommended. 
if you uh, do something like uh, a uh, put a like have a typo or something like that, like similar simple things like typos on elements or typos on next props or or things like mm -hmm. that. That's uh, that's something that they'll catch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk now about uh, next image. So this was a big deal when this came out. Uh, I remember for a while, Gatsby, you know, the, one of the big draws of Gatsby is how it handled images. You could just use Gatsby's yep. built-in image component and point it at the image you were interested in and that it, it would um, you know, use its uh, sharp image library to do some op optimizations. And it would also do uh, the blur up effect um, as some fo folks refer to it, where a, a low res placeholder image would be, you know, inlined inside of the HTML. And then as the user scrolls the, the image into view, that would, uh, a network request would be fired off to get the actual high res image. And it would fade that in at the same time, it's fading out the low res image. So you, you get these, um, this very quick initial load, but still all the high res images when the user actually needs them, right. They get lazy loaded yeah. in. So that was cool. Um, it, it made, you know, performant images very easy on Gatsby sites. And, and I think next, you know, drew some inspiration from that and came out with their own um, image component, which, you know, goes a long way. Um, but we we're wondering if for this next conf, they would, uh, you know, release even more um, features there. Like, do you have any inkling yeah. of what they might do? I mean, one thing is a lot of these like Cloudflare and, and some other um, companies offer image optimization services. And uh, I think there are a handful that Next Image integrates with right now, but it would be nice to see more integrations from that perspective. Um, the other thing, and, and I try to keep up to date on all the different options for Next Image, but there are plenty of options that um, that I would like to see with that, I think when next image first came out, you had to specify like the, the the width and height of the image. Now they have a different layout. You can do like layout fill, or I think there's like a layout intrinsic. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a bunch of different ways that you can render that image. I expect it to work even more seamless. Um, something I've noticed is that depending upon the CSS on my site or uh, the way I have things rendered. Sometimes I'm using next image and like the image either doesn't appear because it doesn't know what the site, the size of the viewport is or something like that. Or it's like over the, over top of the full screen. And rather than spending time trying to make it all work, I end up just going back to a normal image element. Um, so anything they can do to update that developer experience around next image uh, is good, you know, it'll just pay off. Um, and so, and this also works with core vital, core web vitals, right? So image loading is a huge component to core web vitals and you want your images to be right sized and, um, you know, optimized for the viewport and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so excited that images are, it's becoming easier and easier to do images right on the yep. web, you know, for, for so long, I, I come from the WordPress world and I can tell you, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, it, it was possible to, you know, do some of these techniques like lazy loading images, but it's required so much work. You know, you have to, yeah. you have to write some manually, write some JavaScript that would figure out, okay, where are the images? Where's the, you know, the low res placeholder holder image that I need to target with jQuery and fade out and then I need to manually fetch the, you know, the, the high res one and then pop that in, fade, fade that in uh, to the viewport without having these cumulative layout shift issues where you have like, you know, jank going on because the dimensions, you know, aren't what you expect or whatever else. And I'm just yeah. so excited that uh, some of these frameworks in particular are making things like that very easy, you know, doing handling images, right. So that the page is, is quick and performant for, for users. Uh, next, let's talk about Next.js Live. This one was really eye-opening for me at the last Next.js conference. You know, it, it took me from viewing Next.js as um, and 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 Vercel as uh, a a framework for building sites on React. You know, and and it, it kind of morphed that view in my mind to um, something that 
you know, has, uh, uh, other tools, I guess, to, yeah. to, to augment or to supplement that core offering that they have, you know, so next JS live, um, my, my kind of takeaway and understanding of it is that it's a real time collaboration tool that not only mm -hmm. developers can use, but even per their demos in the last next JS conference, um, even folks like in your, uh, on your design team, um, yep. or, or, or product, product owners, yeah, product folks or whatever, um, all of all of them, if they have accounts, you know, with with Vercel and have have done the setup, they can then, you know, collaborate in real time and draw. Um, you know, they can do annotations and things like that on the yeah. screen, and and others who are um, who are looking at the same app at that same time would see all of that in in real time. So it kind of takes a React application and says, what if we made this into kind of a Google Doc? you know, multiplayer collaborative editing situation. What if we kind of like merge the two together and that's what next live is. Um, it has some pretty cutting edge tech powering it. Like I'm on the website now and it says it uses service workers, web assembly, ES modules, yeah. Sucre, Sucre, so I haven't heard of that one and Tailwind JIT, um, and so on that it, uh, that it leverages. Um, and a lot of that runs like right in your browser, which is pretty amazing. Instead of ha having to yeah. go to your command line, run some command to like spin up an, an app and get it running. Um, a lot of this functionality that powers this Next.js Live, they're able to run like directly in the browser, which is pretty mind blowing. Yeah. And it can run, it can run in like in a sandbox and you don't need to download extensions. Like you don't need to have node and NPM and, and everything on your computer to run it. Yeah. Uh, and, and for designers or product folks, like they don't even need to know anything about the language. Right. You just give them a URL, they go there and now you're collaborating. Um, and you can do real time updates as you work through, a a, a problem. So the other thing that's great about this, that, you know, it remains to be seen, but they've mentioned that this is an open source tool that it will be made generally available to everyone. So you could self host this tool. Um, so I'm interested to see that evolve and see what, see where that goes and have, you know, multiple options for, uh, mm -hmm. for using this tool on, on whatever platform you're using. Uh, but yeah, the biggest thing I think is like, oftentimes, uh, I'm sure, you know, people building sites out there, you get a design, the design is like pixel perfect. Uh, and then there are certain changes that you need to make to the design based on new requirements or. Uh, or based on, you know, the inability to deliver a certain design on time or something like that. So you need to have a difficult conversation with product and design and everything. And, and if everything is theoretical or they have to wait for you to make some, you know, tiny change, it, it can take a long time and it can take several meetings. But with some sort of collaboration tool where as the developer, you can just, you know, put it up into this tool and you can live edit and kind of show them what different things would look like uh, in real time. That is just like incredibly powerful and it can save, you know, several hours of work and meetings and, uh, and shipping links around and everything. Right. Right. Yeah. That's very cool. I'm, I'll definitely have my eye on that one. Um, what, another thing we uh, expect um, to hear more about, uh, in this next JS conf is, uh, Vercel's analytics platform. Um, like, Will, what do you think, um, might happen there? What could they yeah, add so, to make it more enticing? I think they announced at the last next, uh, next JS conf, they, they announced Vercel analytics. Um, and so it's still kind of in an early phase. Uh, I know, you know, people are, are using it. So what I'm excited to see is some examples of, some of the early people who have bought into analytics and what they've gained from it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then new features, I mean, certain, uh, what's really nice in a Next.js app to be able to see is like the performance of every single page on your site. Right. And if they're being able to figure out particularly on your dynamic pages, which dynamic pages are slow. So if you have a certain, uh, post on your WordPress site, that loads a little bit slower than others, you can poke in and see what the issue is. And maybe you identify like, hey, there's a large image or there's some sort of plugin that we're including on some posts and that plugin is slowing down. So you can really poke in and figure out how to optimize. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, this seems to be part of a larger trend I'm seeing on the web. Like for for years and years, it seemed like 99% of websites, you know, the answer was just just use Google Analytics. Yeah, everyone everyone's using it. It's you know, it's the kind of the de facto. But the last few years, I've seen I've seen uh, Fathom Analytics, Simple Analytics, a few other you know contenders pop up for folks due to, you know, maybe privacy, um, concerns or whatever that, that they might have with, um, with Google. And also this sentiment that I don't need all this data, right? Google analytics, like breaks it, breaks it down in such a granular way. And a lot of, you know, folks, I think for years, we're looking at that data going, yeah, but if I'm not, you know, using any, using some of the stuff to inform my decision-making, I I may only care about, you know, the, 50% 50% of the data it's giving me, not, not yeah. all of this, all of this stuff. So I could, you know, conceivably use an alternative. Uh, and then, you know, Netlify came out with their um, uh, analytics, you know, product for their platform. And now Vercel is following suit with that as well. Yeah. And the, the other thing that, uh, that something like this analytics platform can bring to the table is like, is all around core web vitals too. I mean, being able to see, your core web vital score for every page, because it's not just about, you know, your core web vital score for your homepage, um, but at every page and also a more, given that it's, you know, it's Next.js and they they understand the different links that exist on your internal links on your site and what pages exist on your site a little bit in a little bit more detail than Google uh, and Google Analytics. Mm. They might be able to give you a more uh, detailed, like a, a real experience that a, that a real user might get on your site, as opposed to just a robot visiting your site, loading the page and seeing how fast it loads. Right. Yeah. Right. The more generic. Yeah. Metrics. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and the last expected item here, um, is ESM modules by default, as opposed to, yeah. to common JS. So what would that uh, look like? Well, if they announced that. Yeah, so uh, you know, NPM Node and NPM are supporting ESM modules in a little bit more over time, uh, and I think that we're really on the cusp of people just changing to ESM by default. And I think that Next uh, Next already has this behind a feature flag, and uh, and one thing in the past with Next that's been a little bit frustrating. I mean, and it's it's kind of a fragmentation issue in the NPM wor- uh, node world right now. Uh, mm-hmm. Some some libraries and, and packages out on NPM will publish ESM module only. And, yeah. uh, and so if you're trying to bring that into an application that can't, um, you know, utilize it, you have mm-hmm. to first transpile it. And so there are, with next sites where you're not using ESM, um, there's a plugin to transpile the modules before you send them to next in your next config. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that can just slow your build time and, and cause a lot of frustration. And, and if you're not aware of it, uh, you get a weird error and you think, oh, I can't use that library because it's not compatible with next. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see them kind of flip the switch and embrace ESM modules uh, by default. And, and I really do think that'll happen. What we, and I, this is a topic uh, in general that I'm really interested in because what, what we've had to do with Faust, uh, we want to support both common JS and DSM. And I mean, in an ideal world, we would only have to support one uh, and we would want to support ESM because that's the future, but there are still, um, frameworks and build tools and things using common JS. And so we nevertheless need to support it. So we have a pretty complicated, uh, build process and, um, you know, and runtime, uh, process for supporting common JS and ESM. And it'd be nice to be able to refine that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that was it for the items we, um, anticipate you know, hearing more about and, and getting some uh, incremental improvements on. Um, next, we'll dive into some of our wish list items, just things we think as as users of and fans of of Next.js for many um, you know web projects, just things we think would be cool uh, to see added. Uh, and the first on our list 
is um, related to the SWC compiler uh, that Next.js yeah. uses, um, uh, in, using that to improve build performance. Yeah, so uh, under the hood, Next uses Webpack by default. That's, you know, it uses Webpack to build your files and, uh, and it uses Babel to transpile um, and it uses the TypeScript, you know, it, it does TypeScript compilation too. Uh, SWC kind of replaces uh, Webpack and Babel and, uh, and is, you know, can be, pr is proven to be about 20 times faster than Babel. And next, I think a 11.1 release of Next.js implemented SWC, but not by default. So you have to explicitly enable it. Opt in. Yeah. yeah. And my guess is most people have not opted in. Um, I am excited to see them flip the switch on that and say it's going to be SWC by default. Uh, the one caveat I have with that is that as far as I know, you know, SWC doesn't support custom, some of the custom Babel plugins that you use. So currently, if you're using custom Babel plugins, you don't want to, you know, you want to stay on Webpack with Babel uh, compilation. But uh, my hope would be that in the future, if Next goes SWC by default, uh, it can fall back gracefully to Babel if it needs to, if it notices mm -hmm. that you're uh, running custom Babel plugins. Yeah. Yeah. And that's more of a developer experience thing than anything else, but man, it just feels so good to be able to move fast, you know, as you're, as you're developing uh, sites and not wait around for, for builds to finish and so on. So that'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, next one on our list here is support for Dino. So yeah. What the heck is Dino will, why would I want <laughs> to have my next app, uh, you know, supported on on Dino instead of Node.js. Uh, yeah, think of Dino as Node, but way better. Uh, and the <laughs> that's just in my personal unbiased, uh, uh, yeah, unbiased opinion. Clears but, it right uh, up. Yeah, Dino is it was created by the founder of Node, and we've talked about it a little bit on this podcast and in some live coding um, things, and we and you know yeah. I've spoken at some conferences about Dino, but uh, but yeah, Dino is a uh, kind of TypeScript first node uh, node competitor, um, and it is generally generally takes some of the learnings from Node uh, and some of the um, you know for lack of a better term regrets that the founder of Node of Node has yeah. uh, about Node's implementation and fixes those problems. So that uh, one example of that is dependencies um, importing dependencies and and versions and the package JSON stuff in general yep. um is security, kind of fixed. And yeah, security, and security is huge as well right having to, to opt yep. into everything instead of you know whatever the whatever the scripts ask for just just do what they yeah. say no questions asked kind of model that node has yep so I, i'd say that it would be a stretch for next.js to support dino but i would love to see it happen mm -hmm. um and just have built-in support for dino that would be great yeah that seems like it would be very enticing for like folks in the enter enterprise space, you know, maybe they're, they want to use Next.js because of all the, you know, momentum and features and so on that it has for their front end code base. Um, but they like some of the aspects of Dino, like not having, uh, not having the security model where like any of your NPM packages, if they're trying to write to the file system or trying to make requests, you just let, you know, just do whatever they say. Whereas with Dino, you can, Kind of dial it down a bit and and really you know have fine grained control over the security that would be very compelling i would think to a lot of enterprise folks as well as the dependency stuff like you mentioned will instead of having you know the the whole node and npm ecosystem is in this spot where a lot of people are frightened that like if npm js.org ever got wiped off the face of the earth like where would we all how would we all you know get get these packages it, there's kind of a single source of truth there which is feels kind of dangerous for the whole globe to be using. Yeah. That and actually a, NPM a went down. Uh, I mean, this is just like last week NPM <laughs> went down for an hour or two, um, you yeah. know, and I just shut off my computer and went out for a walk because my can't do anything without NPM. So, uh, so yeah, so I think that 
Dino kind of fixes a few of those um, issues, definitely a centralization around dependencies issue. But uh, yeah, yeah, I I think it's far fetched to say that uh, Next will support it. Support it. I think um, more and more I see hosting companies supporting Dino, mm -hmm. but it's still kind of in the early days. Yeah, yeah. The pain for a lot of them, I think, isn't there enough to to yep. make that make that leap, but we'll see. Um, what about TypeScript? So another, you know, possible, some would view it as a, uh, <laughs> as an advantage, I guess, or, uh, an improvement, but, um, how about TypeScript right now? If I do NPX create next app, I get a JavaScript project, right. But I yep. can optionally, you know, pass a flag and get, get up and running with TypeScript. So, so will do you, you know, would you want that to be flipped? Yeah. I mean, it, so I, Anyone who has is a longtime listener of this podcast knows my my feelings on TypeScript. I love TypeScript and have been using it for years since it was before it was even public. Um, and I would love to see that be the default in Next when you create a new Next app. And my reasoning for that is I think there are plenty of people who don't know TypeScript. Uh, but getting started with TypeScript is relatively easy, especially if you have an example of like a good TypeScript application. So it would be nice to uh, to see that. And the other thing I think about there is, uh, you know, TypeScript is just becoming more and more popular. Uh, the um, the Jamstack uh, survey that went out, yeah, just proved. I mean, JavaScript is still number one, but TypeScript is is close behind. And I mean, they're, they're essentially the same thing, uh, but TypeScript satisfaction is way higher. It's kind of in a, right. an upper echelon in terms of satisfaction. So people using TypeScript, especially on larger sites uh, are, are having a much better time than those using JavaScript. Yeah. Got it. Um, what about this crazy idea of a next video component? Right. Yeah. Earlier so in the that's episode we talked about next next uh, image. Yeah. They do with with video. Do you think? Yeah, that's my own my own personal wish is that something uh you know something needs to be done about videos now. Next image does like image uh, transpiling and like you know creating the right sized images and things. I'm not talking about that with next video or or, or some sort of video component. Um, I don't expect you to like put, do some on the fly video transpiling. Uh, however, there are certain things that you could implement with a video component that I think would be really helpful for, um, for core web vitals and just site performance in general. Uh, the one thing is, uh, what a lot of people do today is they create an image thumbnail for a video they show that first on their site and then when the user goes and clicks it they load the video either right in that component or they load a, a pop-up you know like a modal dialogue thing that plays a yeah. video or something it would be really nice to have a single component where you can just put the um either the path to a local video or a video out online and it could dynamically generate a um, a thumbnail, right size it using like next image or something like that uh, sure. and do and do get the whole image optimization in addition to the functionality of letting the user click on the video and having it play um, at the right time, right and not having mm -hmm. to load all the scripts or load it in an iframe uh, even if the user never wants to play the video. so so I think that, Anything around that is possible, uh, and it would be nice to see see them at least announce it. I'm, um, you know, I don't know that yep. it would be ready for prime time, but announcing something like that would be huge. Yeah, it would be cool. On a previous episode, I I had talked about uh, the light YouTube embed uh, yep. NPM package I like uh, by Paul Irish. Um, that's a cool one that does what you're describing, where it has just a a thumbnail with a play icon on top of it looks like you know a video embed is actually not it's just you know just the image and then when the user clicks on that it on the fly 
you know, grabs the iframe and then replaces it and starts playing the video immediately. So, yep. so yeah, that, that kind of thing, you know, can certainly be done now, but it reminds me of, you know, the comments I made earlier in the episode about um, Gatsby's image component, how it made it so darn easy to do the fast yeah. performant thing. People just did it because it was just done for, you know, nearly done for you if you just opt into using that, that image. So, so yeah, maybe you could get some of the same benefits from next image, you know, or do the right thing the first time yeah, with, with zero effort. <laughs> the other thing about having a, a component like that within next, it can, it can really help uh, the Vercel's analytics platform, understanding, you know, all the videos you have, which are optimized, how they're clicked and, and things like that. And with the, True. with the video component, they can do that without you having to touch anything without it. You would have to kind of implement some of that yourself. Yeah. That's an interesting point too. Uh, next up on our list is, um, having client only, uh, routes. Um, yes. this is, this is something I, uh, am used to from working with Gatsby. So if you read Gatsby's docs, um, they have, you know, their recommendations for doing, uh, authenticated pages, for example, things that where you, you know, you don't care about, um, SEO, but you want logged in users to be able to visit a certain route. What you can choose to do is have, uh, is set certain routes as client only routes. So these aren't, these are not pages that are generated at build time when your app actually builds. But when the at runtime, when the user is actually using it, if they try to navigate to that route, it does in fact exist and it gets rendered on the fly for that authenticated user, for example. And Next right now doesn't have uh, the concept of a client only route. Is that right, Will? Like what, what could we gain from, from that? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the exact term that Next uses for it, but by default in your Next app, they use something called like automatic static generation or something like that, where if you uh, have a page that doesn't export get server side props or uh, get static props, mm -hmm. Next will automatically attempt to statically generate your page. Uh, and while this might work for uh, for a lot of pages, there are certain pages that uh, that really want to be rendered client side only. Something I'm thinking about there is like previews. Uh, so if you have a preview page, there's really no reason for you to do any static generation on a preview page because it's by nature a very dynamic thing. Um, and you also don't necessarily care about the speed of loading a preview. You just want to see the preview. Uh, so I think that right currently there's no way to configure a page and say, hey, I only want to render this client side. Um, now you you can still do it. I mean, you can have client side only pages, uh, but what you end up with is with React when you try to do server side rendering or static generation, and the uh, the DOM tree looks different client side once you get client side versus server side when you're trying to rehydrate your app. React will throw a warning. So you'll see a lot of these warnings in the uh, developer console when you're building the app. And it's just not a great experience, uh, developer experience. And, and, and it also, um, you know, wastes more clock cycles for your server to be rendering these pages when you actually want to do it client side only. Yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, on the note of uh, routing as well, uh, let's talk um, Next.js API routes. Uh, so yeah. currently um, they're accessible like when your app is is up and running and being used by the, um, you know, used in the browser by, uh, by a user. If a request is fired off to an API route, you know, that request is live and able to process the, the request. Um, but that's not the case at build time. You have to add some extra logic there. Um, so how could that change will, and how do you think it could be, you know, a cleaner experience? Yeah. And I'll start this by saying, I don't think anything is going to change, but I think it would be nice if you at least had some sort of configurability on this, but, uh, so next recommendation for get server side props or get static props is that you, if you have API routes in your project, you don't use those API routes. Instead, you 
import whatever you need. So that might even be like a direct connection to your database. Mm -hmm. uh, and you make the calls directly using that and then return whatever you need on props. Uh, this doesn't work in a number of cases, but what also doesn't work is I can't make a fetch call to those API routes on localhost or something when I, uh, I'm building my site. So next sure. isn't running your API routes. Um, and in, in Faust sites and other, you know, even sites using something like Apollo or things, uh, a lot of times what you have is these frameworks and Faust in particular, uh, what it does is it lets you build your pages as if everything is client side and you're making fetch requests or whatever, all of it's client side. Then Faust figures out all the queries you made, creates a cache, pushes that cache onto props and then restores it. Uh, client side. Apollo has a similar mechanism for doing this. And so by default, they don't really follow a pattern of like getting all this data and, and configuring your props that you're returning from get next uh, or get static props or get server side props. Yeah. You're just returning a cached object. Uh, and, and that enables you to write pages that just make fetch requests and get data as if it's a client side application. Um, which makes actually porting to something like Next.js very easy from something like Create React App. Uh, but if you're trying to hit your API, you know, and make fetch requests from your pages, it won't work during build time. So you have to find a workaround. And the workaround mm -hmm. is not great. It feels a little bit like an anti-pattern. Um, now, I understand it can be more performant. It can, you know, decrease... If you're going making direct calls to the database, it can decrease your build because you don't have to make a fetch request that goes through a bunch of API logic and then get to your database. But yeah, uh, it just feels a little bit like an anti-pattern depending upon how you want to build out your your site. Yeah. So I think a very simple thing would be uh, Next can run the API routes during the build, and that would kind of solve that problem. Right. Um, next, we want to talk about what might be a contentious thing, and that is, uh, I guess it would be Vercel, um, introducing yeah. some kind of a unified data layer. And folks listening to the podcast who are familiar at all with Gatsby will probably immediately think of how things are done there, where you have uh, a collection of source plugins you know, that Gatsby has, uh, and you can kind of compose those together um, so that you're able to in your Gatsby application, pull data from a number of different sources, but all of that data flows through this single unified GraphQL um, data layer that, that Gatsby has. Uh, because Gatsby has that, it, it is able to have this knowledge of what data is coming into the app and where exactly it's being used. So when whenever data changes, it's able to invalidate and rebuild certain pages, which kind of harkens back to one of the... Um, uh, items we talked about earlier, the on-demand page revalidation, you know, it would, it would, uh, that's what allows Gatsby to do that. Um, but it's not without its trade-offs. You know, I've seen folks in the, in the react space, you know, use Gatsby and then come away with it thinking, I just wanted to fetch, I have like an RSS feed where my podcast episodes, you know, exist on the web. I just want to make a direct like fetch call to it and just render my episodes on the list. That's it. It's very simple. Gatsby wants me to like, you know, there's, I can't find a source plugin that allows me to do the thing that I need. So now I have to look into like, how do I build from scratch a brand new source plugin that, you know, injects the data, uh, the data that I'm looking for into Gatsby's, you know, GraphQL data layer so that, you know, just so that I can fetch my data and put it on the page, you know, so they come yeah. up, come away with it, throwing up their hands going, I'm going to next because it's, I can just query the data from wherever I want. And that, and that's true. I would, I would agree with that criticism. It's easier in Next.js to just query from arbitrary APIs wherever and whenever you need it in your app. Um, but that, you know, as I said, that comes with the trade-offs and that is the app is, is now less aware of what data is exactly being fetched from where and what pages is it used, used on, you know, so you, you would lose that. So like, well, like, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What do you think, um, you know, 
should Next.js or, or Vercel, should Vercel, you know, um, roll this out uh, as an opt-in kind of thing. So if you want, want those benefits to be able to, you know, revalidate certain pages when their data changes, that would be an option or should that they move to that completely or it'd be the only option? What would be best? Yeah. Yeah. I think there are a whole host of companies that are now, so, you know, coming out with products centered around unified GraphQL API or mm -hmm. uh, unified API in general. Mm -hmm. And so I think it seems like a natural progression for Vercel or, or, or all hosting companies really. Um, and the one thing that Next.js has done that I like over Gatsby, and you kind of alluded to this, Gatsby is very opinionated about everything. Uh, you know, how you yeah. build out your site, how you build out your API. And it sometimes you get into these awkward situations where you have to build a source plugin to get your data out of Gatsby, uh, Gatsby's unified API. I would like to see what an unopinionated approach to this would look like. Next mm -hmm. is very has been thus far pretty unopinionated in terms of um, that that kind of thing. So uh, I would really like to see what what it looks like to be able to um, you know piecemeal create a content mesh as necessary. Because um, for what you said, like an RSS feed, yeah, you may not care about that being part of some unified API, right? Like. For right. your unified API, you're thinking maybe you have some Salesforce data, maybe you have some WordPress data, uh, maybe you have some data from your, um, you know, some other marketing tool you're using or uh, or like a Google Calendar or something like that. Like all of those things make sense for a unified API, but there are also things that you want to fetch just ad hoc. And, yeah. uh, and for those, you may not want a unified, or you may not really want to invest the time to create a unified API for them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an interesting world. It's like, you know, is there enough interest there, um, for, for, for Vercel to, you know, bring to market, uh, a unified, you know, API layer mm -hmm. and, and would it be able to differentiate itself from other competitors? Like you said, one graph or Apollo or others who are who have similar products um, or Gatsby, if they, you know, spun out um, that unified GraphQL data layer just as a standalone product, then yeah. you might be able to hook it up to, to next, right. And, and, uh, in Vercel, um, you know, their product would, would kind of feel like, like it was, uh, just duplicating what exists in, in the ecosystem already. So yep. it's interesting. Um, uh, the last item here I added to our list to our wish list uh, items because I, I see uh, some of the, a lot of the attention um, that's centered around Astro lately in the community. Um, so for folks unfamiliar, if you uh, go to astro.build in a browser, um, it's this new uh, framework that's come on the scene. It allows you to write components um, using, Astro has their own you know, uh, version of components, but you can also write in React or Vue or Svelte. Um, or, or even other frameworks, I believe, uh, whatever your framework of choice is. And then it uses uh, what's called the islands architecture, where it, it ships zero JavaScript to the browser by default. And then you can choose to load JavaScript uh, in three different ways. You know, one is on page load. You, know, you can have the JavaScript there, there immediately. Another option would be um, you can do it uh, on scroll. So if these are scrolls, a certain part of the page that has some interactivity into view that actually needs JavaScript, you can on the fly, you know, fetch it. Um, and there, there are, uh, I'm forgetting the third, but there's a, a third option for, you know, fetching things as well. So the idea is you ship as little JavaScript on the initial page load as necessary. And you have the, these islands of your site that require interactivity when the user actually needs to interact with those at that moment, that's when you're, you know, fetching and executing the, the JavaScript and using it. So, so folks in the community have, um, I've seen some, some buzz and some attention around, um, Astro. I don't know how like long it would last and how likely it would yeah. be for companies to use this in production, but I think, you know, it's cool. It's always cool to see new approaches and maybe glean some ideas from those. So I can see, you know, a, a future where, um, Vercel and the folks behind Next.js would look at you know, the, the popularity and attention around a tool like Astro and then consider, you know, uh, consider changing Next.js so that they're able to evaluate a certain route on the site. If they realize 
this is 100 static kind of, it's like the about page right yep. it just has like this is me this is my blog here's an image of me end of page right they could um choose this to, to ship just a html page that doesn't uh load javascript ever just because it doesn't need it but the moment the user navigates to another another route or performs an action that might need javascript at that time it would you know download and execute the the bundle um so will, what are your thoughts on that like do you think would they yeah gain- i think they could even come out that- with you know particular components that you can include in your front end that separate the like here's this is a dynamic component this is a server component like kind of how react server components are are fabled uh right. <laughs> react server components right. i guess are are supposed to work uh nextjs could definitely come out with something like that yeah and the other buzzword here is um partial hydration so this is like r- right now what's common is you have a certain um element on the page like a div with an idea of root or something like that and that's your um that's where your act uh where your react app is uh it's it's, it's it's that's its insertion point so to speak right so it can it can controls uh everything inside of that um of that component that's where it takes or that element and that's uh what it re-renders is is changes that need to be made within you know that wrapper uh div component um, with partial hydration, that would unlock a feature where you would have um, other elements on the page, you know, f- further down the tree, and they would get rehydrated only rather than this, you know, the the entire application. Um, there are some some considerations there that make that like a difficult thing to do. Right now, like the easier thing to do is just to always have that root, you know, div, um, and just use that across every page. But uh, but it could be. It could be cool. It could provide some performance gains if that was, you know, baked into Next.js. So sure. I'm interested to see the impact Astro will have, just generally speaking, on you know maybe features that that Next or even Gatsby or other players in the space might, you know, might bake into their own products. Yep. So uh, I think that wraps things up. Any final thoughts on Next.js? Are you excited? Are you going to tune in? Um, yeah, I'll definitely yeah, well, be tuned in, uh, and I am I am really excited. And they've been hyping it up, so I'm expecting big things from uh, from Vercel at NextConf. And uh, you know, I'd encourage anyone else to go out there and register. Uh, it's free. It's remote. You can you know access it from your bedroom. So <laughs> very easy to get involved. And if you if you're excited about the future of Next, you definitely don't want to miss it. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm excited. I'll be tuning in and looking forward to to hear how wrong we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I <laughs> expect uh, of the of the uh, you know 15 things we talked about here, uh, probably two of them will be <laughs> will be used. Yeah, now, I think I think hey. we're probably a little bit more accurate than that, but we'll see. Yeah, well, it was a fun conversation, nonetheless. So yeah, it's always good yeah. to dream. It's always good to dream. All right. So uh, we'll call it with that. Um, thanks everybody for, for listening and stay tuned for uh, the next episode of Decode and also for Next.js uh, conference coming up um, pretty soon if you're listening to this uh, earlier in October 2021. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.